wanted to follow up on a couple of questions that came through uh, at the end of last time. I misunderstood one, and so I just wanted to clarify now. The question I read off in regards to uh, reliability and multiple SDs, and I revised that to multiple DVs, but then Janet and Kobe were kind enough to clarify that perhaps the person was indicating during discrete trial instruction or one-on-one -on -one teaching, oftentimes we'll rotate among multiple teaching targets. And whether I was saying that it's not good to measure performance on multiple teaching targets across trials, that's totally fine. We do not have data to suggest that that is a risk factor for low reliability. Um, my recommendation was more in reference to measuring multiple DVs concurrently. Okay, so in trial-based, it's occurrence, non-occurrence per trial. You're focused on one response at a time. Um, no reason to shy away from interspersing your trials, teaching multiple targets in a single teaching session. So I apologize for the misunderstanding or my misinterpretation of that. And then I also wanted to um, get to a question briefly that we didn't make it uh, to. Someone wrote, what about difficult situations uh, where you think a more data-driven approach would be appropriate, but you're not in charge? Um, and obviously, without a lot of detail on that situation, what I can reassure you is that uh, even if you're not the decision maker, if the decision maker is a board certified behavior analyst, um, you have the responsibility, if you're a BCBA yourself, to actually gather more information, um, reflect on your uh, guidelines for responsible conduct, which we're about to talk quite a bit about. And um, if the information, when you approach the, the person who may not be covering all of their bases in terms of the use of data to make decisions, um, if that conversation doesn't satisfy your concerns, you can share with them the codes of conduct, the guidelines that you're worried about, and um, work together to formulate a plan to remedy the situation. It's also important that you document you know, those interactions um, moving forward and, and just try to take the most local uh, and sort of diplomatic approach in the early stages. Um, and obviously, if you're concerned about the welfare of any clients, then a, a more serious measure would be early, uh, necessary earlier. Um, so again, it's difficult without all the information, but I hope that those tips are helpful to speak with your colleagues or supervisors who may not be uh, meeting their responsibilities to use data. Um, ask for more information. Make sure you're well informed before you pass judgment. And then if there are concerns, via the guidelines, um, it's appropriate to create a plan for follow-up for either changing things or perhaps changing your um, relationship with that colleague. Um, so I hope that's useful. Um, I have a little levity too. Well, it's sort of funny. It's sort of serious. So my son Noah, who's actually going to appear in some of the preference assessment videos that I share later, um, he's almost two and he's just drawn to danger. Um, He's really into crayons and coloring right now. You know, they, he uses the big boy crayons that have just that little tip. They're not very big. And he's found it interesting in recent weeks to put them in the light sockets around our house, okay? Now, most often our light sockets are covered, but we do have a few that we use often. We don't always remember to put the covers back in. So Noah comes along with his crayons and he just sort of jams them in there. And sometimes he adds a little food and sometimes, you know, other things find their way. Not good conductors, okay? I'm not, I'm not really worried about electrocution, but I am worried about, you know, teaching him it's okay to sort of explore and experiment with light sockets. So what typically happens in my house is um, we're always doing at least three things at once. And if Noah's got time to play with light sockets, that probably means we're busy. Um, um, so I'll be flying around doing different things and notice he's jamming the blue, you know, into the light socket. And I'll say, Noah, don't put things in the light socket. And he'll stop and he'll look at me and he'll laugh and then kind of pretend to do something else. And I take a step away and immediately it's like, okay, and now it's the yellow's turn. Or now it's, you know, um, soy burger turn. And it goes in. And so from across the room I turn again and I say, Noah, nothing in the light socket. Cut it out. And he looks at me and stops and laughs. And seconds later, he's back at it. And I'm using this example because this next section is all about how um, we need data to anchor our decisions um, as parents sometimes, but definitely as behavior analysts. And that little bit of a disruption to the behavior that I don't want to see is enough to reinforce me continuing to deliver these reprimands that are a temporary, but a temporarily effective solution. So even though that's not the best way for me to respond to the situ situation, I keep doing it because of his momentary disruption. And that's powerful information. That lets us know that we as teachers are not beyond the principles of behavior, right? We behave in orderly ways too. So um, as I try to keep my son safe, um, and as I try to share some useful tips with you, uh, we'll come back to more illustrations of how factors other than data and the best bases for decision making do influence what we, what we do, what we choose to do as teachers and as parents too. 
Okay, um, so getting right into it, last section we focused a lot on selecting and developing solutions. In this section, we're going to kind of shift our attention to the um, treatment uh, modification and evaluation process, how we actually gather data to make decisions within the context of a treatment that's already been selected. And we're interested in the ethical uh, guidelines around these issues. So first we need to define what a good decision is. We set the bar high, okay? It's a clear, high standard for the kind of work that we do as um, evidence-based educators and evidence-based practitioners. Um, the outcome has to be satisfying. Satisfying to whom? Satisfying to the clients, caregivers, and other affected parties. Um, they're the ones who get to determine whether the change is meaningful, whether our job is done. Okay, and you can already see where we would need data, good objective data, to really tell us when we've reached that high, clear goal. The outcome also has to be lasting. So the client needs to be able to maintain and generalize the skill that's been established or replace the problem behavior. And also the teachers and caregivers responsible for that client's education or their uh, vocation or their well-being needs to be able to shift focus to new problems that we can help to solve, new skill areas that we can develop. If you find yourself coming back to the same behavior, the same goals over and over again, we probably haven't achieved both a meaningful or satisfying and lasting outcome. So we set the bar high. How do we go about making these decisions? Well, the BACB, uh, again, has provided us with guidelines for responsible conduct that offer a clear path to that high bar. It's a reliance on scientific knowledge, okay? More specifically, behavior analysts, and I don't mean to marginalize any educators or others who are in the audience, but this is our, our starting point and obviously my training background, but there are parallel pieces of legislation in the education world and certainly parallel pieces of legislation and um, codes of conduct in um, areas such as speech language pathology, but this is our, you know, this is our jumping off point for today. The behavior analyst relies on scientifically and professionally derived knowledge uh, when making scientific or professional judgments. Okay, so pretty clear data first and decisions based on those data. So our decisions uh, have some features or processes that go along with them. Um, it's always going to require, we're making really good decisions, really meaningful and lasting decisions, the collection and review of individual behavior data. It should always include the modifications of programs based on those data. So not only do you need to have the data, you need to see the data and use it to inform your next steps. I think, again, sometimes there's a disconnect there where we collect data as a matter of routine, but we don't necessarily take the time to analyze what we've got, to interpret it, and to apply it to um, where we're headed next. And then finally, we need to produce uh, measurable, socially valid effects. So we actually measure the outcomes of the decisions we've made. Have we done enough? Are we done yet? Can we move on to something else? So what do you guys think? What are some of your sources of knowledge? I think this is kind of an ideal scenario, and I know you can't probably see this diagram easily, so I've got the um, elements bulleted, but in the center, uh, you have your decisions, your professional decisions. Some of these are treatment-related decisions, assessment-related decisions, um, teacher integrity-related decisions. And ideally, this is, this is sort of the way that we would practice. We would base our decisions on things like our knowledge of the scientific method, our knowledge of experimental control and when you really have a cause-effect relationship, certainly basic principles of behavior such as reinforcement and extinction, and also seminal research. So if you're uh, working with a lot of uh, adults or individuals, um, younger individuals too, with uh, problem behaviors, uh, the seminal literature on experimental functional analysis and function-based treatment is an important touchstone or decision-making resource for you. It's an important source of knowledge. In early intervention, we look to Lovas and his students, um, among others. Uh, if you're working with folks with conduct issues, uh, you would look to the folks who developed the teaching families model. So we have good literature base that we should come back to often. And maybe that's a part of the knowledge that um, you would cite as contributing to your professional decisions. And we've talked to about evidence-based um, practices. Okay, this is a little bit harder. Um, we're not to the hard part yet. This is, so that was the scientific knowledge. Now we're going to get into the professional knowledge and then the hard part, the part we don't talk about as often. So definitely our ethical codes. Hopefully you're well aware of the codes that regulate you within your organization and within your discipline. Um, supervised practicum experiences, so some formal training, incidental on-the-job training, client assessment results, client and caregiver preferences. These are all good sources of information that you could professionally derive, right, in the work that you do every day. We have ethical codes that necessitate um, these sources of data. So just to give you a couple of examples, the behavior analyst has the responsibility to recommend the scientifically supported and most favorite effective treatment procedure. You catch any additions there? 
Let me try that again. So the behavior analyst has the responsibility to recommend the scientifically supported and his supervisor's most favorite effective treatment procedure. Right? I'm hinting at some of those tough variables we're going to dive into. That there are things other than our data and other than our ethical codes that enter in inevitably to our decision making, just like with NOAA and the light sockets. Okay? Um, so also the behavior anal and analyst assessments, recommendations, are based on information and techniques sufficient to provide substantiation. That's proof. That's evidence. Not just an opinion. That's we show that um, the procedures we've recommended are having a certain effect or are most appropriate. And then finally, the behavior analyst modifies programs on the basis of what? Data. Scientifically or professionally derived data. Why do our teachers, those we supervise to actually implement uh, behavior change procedures, need us to use data? This is related to one of our big goals in this section. We're sort of defining the parameters of what we hope to achieve as behavior analysts or as educators, and we're um, figuring out how we can use data to get there. So teachers, teachers um, need behavior analysts to use data in the respect that uh, we are to delegate uh, only those responsibilities that uh, our supervisees can reasonably be expected to perform competently. How do you know when someone is competent to use a particular procedure? Especially if you don't measure, right? We shouldn't be asking people to do things that we don't have good evidence they can in fact do with integrity. And then finally, uh, if there are envi environmental conditions that hamper implementation of our programs, we seek to eliminate those constraints or to identify in writing why we cannot. Um, how do we know when those constraints are eliminated, right? We have to be measuring. We have to be measuring to see if integrity has in fact improved. If that was the problem, we have to measure to see that student learning has in fact improved if an environmental constraint has been in place. Okay, that's the only way to know that we've really done our job by the codes of conduct, our guidelines for responsible conduct. So I keep throwing this term data around, but I haven't really given you guys a definition. We'll back up and do that real quick before we get into the tough questions about other influences. So the Random House Dictionary, as a starting point, suggests that data are facts, truth, a truth known by experience or observation. It's consistent with the way we think about data, I think. And some synonyms, I really like these, include things like knowledge, evidence, experiments, or my personal favorite, the whole story. Okay. So what are good data? They have three dimensions I'll summarize for you today. The first is that good data are behavioral, when we're in the business of changing individual behavior. That means that we directly measure that which we hope to change. Okay, we don't take proxies for the behavior that needs to change. We don't solicit opinions about whether the behavior has changed. We measure, in fact, the thing that we are teaching, the thing that we're intervening on. So good data are behavioral. Good data are valid and reliable, and I'm putting these on a quality dimension together. We've already talked a bit about reliable data. Um, that means that those data are objective that your operational definitions, the target behavior you're looking for are defined to the extent that independent and trained observers can see when it is and is not occurring and agree um, on those data. The valid dimension's a little bit tougher, but it means relevant. It means um, that we're actually measuring the behavior when it matters most. Um, so I talked earlier about the instance of hand mouthing, where it may be a behavior that occurs throughout the day, but especially when uh, an adult client you're working with is um, not engaged in vocational or academic activities. Um, the most valid data about hand mouthing probably occur when the behavior could be at its worst, do, do its most damage. That is when the person is not engaged. To measure hand mouthing only at times when uh, other programming is ongoing would not give you the most valid sense of what the behavior is really like and what the um, likely impact of that behavior will be on the person's quality of life. So good behavior, uh, good data are both valid and reliable. They're of a high quality. And finally, good data are visual. Okay, I alluded earlier, it's not enough to collect it, sort of give it a cursory overview. We need to actually graph and visually inspect our data so we can learn something at a glance about not just what's happening right now, but the bigger picture of where we've been with a particular client and a particular set of goals. And I'm going to come back to some examples of how the visual di dimension of good data um, is, is really essential. Okay, so where can you get these good data? We talked about the peer-reviewed published literature a lot in the last section, so now we're going to focus on your practice-based evidence. You have a lot of data at your disposal that can teach you things about the needs and effective strategies for working with your clients. So you have archives of past clients who may have had similar um, teaching goals or similar target behaviors. You have teacher integrity or training archives. So again, if one of your main responsibilities is to prepare others to deliver these interventions, you can go back and find out what steps people in the past have struggled with um, or what the prior set of training procedures for those um, interventions looked like. You also have data, and perhaps most importantly, data on your current 
client and teacher behavior. Okay, and these are data that get you right to the heart of what's happening now in the current environment. Remember at the very beginning I told you that data tell you a story about where a person's been, their history, but most importantly, where they are right now, the current environment. There's just no way to access that information other than to capture it yourself um, and to inspect it, as we'll talk about. One quick uh, aside here, if you've ever um, heard of Jeffrey Canada, he runs the Harlem Children's Zone program, uh, which is um, sort of revolutionizing education in Harlem and um, he's a data guy. He has a great TED talk on how data are important and he bemoans standardized testing not on the basis of um, its importance. He agrees it's important to know where students perform relative to some grade level standard but he basically said I needed those data six months ago. I needed those data before those students were moving on to a new grade level where now we know they'll be further behind. Um, and I think that that really points to the importance of current data. Um, and he's seen it in general education just as we see it in our work um, with folks with behavioral um, disorders and concerns uh, that you need to know what's happening right now in time so you can still change something about that. Okay, so a key concept here, your expertise, you guys all bring valuable expertise to the table from formal and informal learning opportunities plus good data equal good decisions. And now we know what each of those components mean, right? Our good data are valid and reliable. They're visual. They're behavioral. They directly measure the thing that we want to change, not just reports about it, not our perceptions of it, but the actual thing. Um, and our good decisions are both lasting and meaningful. Okay, so here's an applica application question for you. We know what good data are. I want you to reflect on your experience in your organization right now. I mentioned this is a clear and high bar. It's not easy to always be getting and using good data. So what's one dimension of data you feel like your systems, the work you do, that you've mastered, either with the people you ser supervise or the work that you do being supervised by others? Also, what's one dimension of good data on which you could improve? So we have a lot of it. We graph it. We look at it all the time. I'm not totally sure how reliable it is. Sometimes it seems like there are some funky other things going on. Think about these three dimensions and really reflect. Where are you doing a great job? Where could you potentially um, find room for improvement? You two web participants. <laughs> if, you're, if you're awake. <laughs> I wouldn't blame you for going back to bed if it's 5 a.m. where you are and yeah. it wasn't lunchtime. Okay, do people feel like they have they can identify a dimension of strength in their organization or their practice, their personal practice, and one where you're not sure? Some of you? Okay, good. I see some heads nodding. We'll come back to this after you have some more concrete examples. Let's get into our strategies for making more ethical and data-driven decisions. Okay, so we need to collect good data to fend off these other variables I've been alluding to. So the things we, um, it's good that we're sensitive to them, but we can be overly sensitive. They should not be driving the bus, okay? Um, so a lot of uh, excuses, not excuses. They're valid reasons that I hear that people don't collect more data, which creates the opportunity for these other influences to get more involved with your decisions, is that people just don't have the time, okay? Spread too thin, don't have the time. And I'm going to address these, I hope, through some strategies um, in this section. No money, so we really don't have the resources uh, financially to equip our teachers with the software they might need or even the relatively simple tools. Um, if you're still on the binder system, it can take a lot of money to get enough binders to keep it all organized and updated and everybody needs a timer and everybody needs, you know, so it's a lot of resources that go into this. Uh, this is one of my favorites. I have no interest in research. Okay, so I don't collect data more often because I'm really, I'm not looking to publish in Java or anything. All of those guidelines we just looked at are in the practice section of the Guidelines for Responsible Conduct. Okay, there is a research, Section 10 of the Guidelines for Responsible Conduct for Behavior Analysts covers additional data-related responsibilities, but everything we've talked about is for practitioners explicitly, explicitly and exclusively. Um, so this one doesn't really fit the bill. Uh, no clear benefits. We don't need the data because we already... That's my signal for I'm not sure what to do. It came back on. Oh, good. Great. Maybe I bumped something. <laughs> You're going to see me doing this the rest of the... Oh. So no clear benefit. Why do we need data when the choice is so obvious? It's obvious that what this child need is func needs is functional communication training for an escape-maintained problem behavior. Okay? 
danger, be careful. Your, your presumptions can be, um, send you in the wrong direction. Uh, we don't have enough training to provide, um, to collect good data or to get people on board to help us collect good data. And I'm going to call this the most subtle and insidious of barriers um, because I think that for my, in my own practice and the work I've done with wonderful people that it's very easy to be guilty of this one and not even realize it. We assume we already are making database decisions. So again, I've got my binders and I've got my graphs and I look at them every so often, but we're really not maybe living up to that standard of demonstrating and proving that we've made a difference in people's lives and that that difference is meaningful and that that difference is lasting. Okay, I think we can do a better job here. Okay, so those other factors. Now I know this is just ridiculous. There's a bunch of other factors on this slide that you can't see, but I'm gonna walk you through. And I want you to think for your next application question about which of these um, might influence your decisions. It would probably be best just to anchor this to something. If you thought about a client, again, one that you've worked with either for an extended period of time or you've worked with very recently, um, where there was a particular goal or treatment program where there had to be a lot of modifications, okay, and you were involved somehow either in delivering the treatments as they were modified or even deciding how to modify the treatments. Um, so it has to be kind of a tough case. And I want you to think about with each of these variables uh, if it's a candidate, if it's something that probably affected the decision-making process with that particular tough client. Everybody clear on what to envision? Okay, so here are your factors to choose from. Competing work or personal deadlines. Okay, so you have a really busy week and even though there's a lot of treatment change going on, um, you have to leave work at some point, right? You need to get home for dinner or you need to get home for your, your own kids. Um, so competing work or personal deadlines. Archival templates, so your organization has sort of a, a set of materials that can be individualized to some extent, but that's sort of the first place you go um, when you're trying to find a solution for a particular case. You rely on what's, you don't reinvent the wheel, you rely on what's been created before. Again, it's not that these are bad influences, they just should not be the primary influences in your decision making. Okay, written or unwritten norms of your workplace. So some workplaces um, or organizations, if you work in the public schools, for example, they have pretty specific rules about the kinds of procedures you can and cannot use um, in the context of education. And it's important that you're aware of those rules as you make your decisions. Um, but here I'm talking about you know, um, procedures you could consider that may not necessarily violate a rule or that with a little bit of work and explanation you could actually have approved, but you sort of disregard them because that's an extra step, right? That's an extra piece we'd have to negotiate. Your learning history with similar cases. How often have you had that feeling like, I've seen this before. I know exactly what this is. My last client was just like this. This is how we'll fix it. I, I've done all of these, by the way, so <laughs> please don't feel like I'm beating up on you. Like, I only have such a long list from reflecting on my own weaknesses. Um, learning history with your supervisors. So I kind of joked about your supervisor's favorite procedure, but once you've been in education or um, you know, intervention for a while, you sort of develop a specialty, develop the things that you're good at or that people consult with you for, and it is, you know, it's, it's normal to have preferences within your toolbox, and, you know, sometimes supervisor preferences become the preferences of the employees, because again, the, or the direct care teachers, so the materials already exist, anything under the sun that goes wrong with this, I'm going to have a solution for it. Sometimes supervisor specialties and preferences can affect our decision making. And then finally, client-mediated consequences. Think of Noah and the light socket, okay? I know he's not a client of mine, but I, there really could not be another human being I was more emotionally invested in helping. Okay, so he's a good proxy, if you think about it. Somebody who I really want to take care of and help, and yet, what do I do when he sticks the crayon in the light socket? I let him keep doing it, because every time I tell him not to, it stops for a second, which reinforces my reprimand of telling him not to. I go back to what I'm doing, and he's back at it. Right? I'm not fixing it in a lasting way, um, but it's enough to keep me deciding to reprimand rather than actually redirect him to another more appropriate activity. That's an example of what I mean by client-mediated consequences. Um, think about extinction bursts associated with um, withholding reinforcement for problem behavior. That's got a pretty good history of reinforcement, especially if you happen to work with adults uh, or big, strong kids. Um, dealing with a burst in problem behavior is a very punishing experience, even for somebody who's done it a whole lot. Uh, it can be scary. It can be unsafe. Um, those are some serious client-mediated consequences that sort of compete with um, 
the likelihood that you'll select a procedure with extinction in it, potentially, and compete with the likelihood that you will deliver that procedure with integrity. That's just the reality. We're, we're human. Our behavior is orderly. Those are some serious client-mediated consequences. Okay, so I hope on this list, as you think about your own application, you can identify at least one variable that might just enter into that decision-making equation before data, okay, or as a more important factor than data. Feel like we can move on with this in mind? Okay, we'll come back to it. Um, did I do this? Oh, I just highlighted this because I'm going to give you examples of each. If we have of the written or unwritten norms and the client-mediated consequences, if we have time. I got to keep moving. So is, is the case, I just want to give a quick qualifier, is the case all, that all you need are data? Um, so good data won't be enough. Okay, I want to acknowledge this for you and your partners um, to deliver the best treatment, those you work with. You need experiences with people. Okay, we can't know what to measure or when to measure it if we don't know something about the people and the values of the people that we're working with. So in talking about all this data, I just wanted to take a moment to stop and say that indirect assessment, um, so not measuring the behavior itself but measuring other things or interviewing, talking to people about things, is a really important first step to discover which behaviors matter most for the individual's lives and which conditions are most important to measure those behaviors. This is a necessary first step, and I don't mean to glaze over it. Okay, so indirect data first, direct data later. Um, there are some great examples of how beneficial this is from the research literature, so we know that you can improve um, the probability of identifying reinforcers during preference assessment, which is going to be our next big focus, by conducting a caregiver nomination interview. So staff or parents who know the person well, they can tell you what items or activities you should be assessing, and you should be getting that information before you go straight to direct data collection and assessment. Interviews before functional analysis can help you limit the number of conditions that need to be included. There's no need to test something that has no report of um, relevance in the person's everyday life. Indirect first, direct later. And then finally, um, if you're treating health-related disorders such as sleep issues, feeding issues, potty issues, issues where there's any chance of an underlying medical issue um, or the need to refer to a medical provider, the, the indirect assessment process is essential. You need a thorough interview to make sure you're even the right person for the job. Okay, so in talking about data, 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 I don't want you to skip getting to know your clients in the more traditional ways. I'm just saying that really knowing your clients or really knowing your supervisees requires that you take that next step as well. Okay, so don't drop this one, just add it to the mix and come back to it often. Okay, if you're feeling like you're not sure uh, whether we're moving toward meaningful outcomes or lasting outcomes, Get back to this point. Reassess. What are our goals? Are we working on the most important things? Is there important information that we've overlooked? Okay, a second strategy. You not, you not only need to get good data, you need to graph good data so that you're sensitized to progress, so that you can make progress visible. And I'm actually stealing those lines from Julie Vargas. She has a great book on uh, effective teaching in which she titles two chapters on graphing, um, sensitizing yourself to progress and making progress visible. And I think that's an important way to think about why we graph. It's not just to have it on file. It's not just to, um, you know, make the research-oriented folks happy. It's so you can actually make decisions based on this content. Okay, so uh, visual inspection is essential for several reasons, and this is where I'm going to get into more examples. So it tells you about treatment efficacy. We saw this with Maeve's graph of the self-care chain that was not going anywhere. Um, it can tell you whether things are working. It can inform you about treatment integrity, so the likelihood that um, the procedure is being implemented as written. Um, so if you know that a student has made progress with other self-care chains with similar teaching procedures, and yet they're not getting anywhere, treatment integrity is the next place you want to look very closely. They can provide information about changes unrelated to treatment. So um, Craig Kennedy, Kennedy and Meyer uh, have a really interesting article in Java about the effects of allergies and sleep deprivation on problem behavior. Okay? And they would not have detected this sort of sporadic but very clear pattern in days that were worse in terms of problem behavior if they hadn't been graphing and looking at those data to know, hey, there might be some underlying medical things going on that we could really relieve some suffering if we detected it. So you know it's just a bad day. You've probably said that phrase or heard people say that phrase. Like, it's just a bad day for behavior. You better be graphing those data because bad days may come on some kind of a you know, um, cyclical in its fashion or in, in certain seasons, you want to tune into that and see if there's, um, again, a medical issue that might need to be relieved. So again, that's Craig Kennedy's work. And then finally, it um, graphed data 
provide you with the opportunity um, for independent interpretation. Okay? Don't be the Lone Ranger. We <laughs> talked about this. It's important to have reliability in your decision-making um, behavior, meaning that you and somebody else with similar experience or knowledge uh, in terms of your discipline and also in terms of the data that your client is producing can look and agree with you, yep, I don't think that's going anywhere. Or, nope, I think I'm seeing signs of progress and we should stay the course. You want to check in with others, have trusted colleagues that you can uh, assess the reliability of your decisions, and graphic data allow you to do that. So some quick examples of each of these, really quick. Um, so uh, treatment efficacy, this is data I'm not proud of, uh, these are data I'm not proud of. We worked in a, a special education classroom and had a very effective intervention which teachers saw us implement and get some aggressive and disruptive behavior under control during group time and we trained them to implement those procedures which they did beautifully and quickly. Um, the fact that they were watching us treat is probably why we see this ascending trend in baseline. They figured out what we were up to because um, they were very smart and they learned quickly from our training but when we came back two weeks later I like to show these data to people who are worried about reactivity. Like, they'll do it well when I'm there. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> Were we effective in our training? No, because this is not lasting, okay, and this is not meaningful um, in that context. And we did see the student problem behavior resume with low integrity, so we had to get back in there and do something more effective. We wouldn't have known the problem was this serious without our data. Okay, data reveal treatment integrity. I know I'm showing you a lot, but I'm about to zoom in on this last section um, right here. So these are data from a toilet training client. Um, and the main uh, closed data path you're looking at is actually frequency of mans in a, a request to use the bathroom in a given day. And you can see that in the first phase, before we intervened, we're getting up to 12 in a single six-hour school day, 12 requests to use the bathroom every 30 minutes. That's a lot. This kid, and we have other assessment data to show, he was getting out of work and getting into a nice break and a nice walk to the bathroom uh, once we taught him that request skill. So we implemented a DRL contingency. This phase shows a nice reduction in the number of bathroom requests per day. But we came back five months later. Here you're looking at red accidents. Okay, so accidents are low. That's good news. I didn't show you all those data in the prior phases because it's a lot of, lot of look. Um, greens, successes, that's great. But look at those requests. 20 times a day in a six-hour school day, upwards of 20 times a day, he's asking to go to the bathroom. What does this tell me? This tells me the teachers did not stick with the DRL, okay? This tells me, again, we need to get back in in order to produce a more meaningful and lasting change. I wouldn't know the situation was like this if I went on their report and if I only measured my primary DVs of accidents and successes. I just couldn't have de detected this problem without my data, without a visual form of my data. Okay, strategy number three. You need to modify your programs on the basis of good data. So again, don't just collect it, don't just look at it, use it in your decision making. And if you find you're not using it, maybe you don't need to collect it. Maybe you could, you know, reallocate your time and effort to other dependent variables or contexts. Okay? Um, I'm going to give you a couple of data versus alternative sources of influence kind of examples. In fact, I'll, I'll probably only have time to go through one of these, but if you have questions on the other, feel free to let me know. Um, so data versus intuition. I like to treat my supervisees well. I like to make decisions that I think might help them do their very difficult jobs uh, in less time or more conveniently. So I'm always on the lookout for good, valid, still effective shortcuts, right? Ways to save time. And one such way that's been talked about in the literature, although risks have been identified, is collecting uh, first trial only versus continuous data during skill acquisition programming. Okay, so we have some studies that suggest you have to be careful defining mastery on only a first trial performance, but that if you extend the requirement for mastery over several assessments, you can still get, you know, good information from first trial only data, and it might be good for teachers for practical reasons, right? It's going to save them time, be more convenient. Okay, so anecdotally, uh, this could have a lot of advantages. This is the kind of change I would think about making, because I want to help my teachers. That's my intuition, that this is going to be easier. A survey suggests this is also relatively prevalent, so one in five um, early intervention programs from one uh, survey in 2009 indicated that they use first trial only data um, to track progress and to make decisions, so it is represented out there. Okay, here's some data on practicality. This first graph is actually treatment integrity, and these are during discrete trial instruction, and these are parents, okay, so novice therapists working with their child with autism. We provided with them with some good training in advance, and we just wanted to watch their delivery of the teaching over time. 
The only difference between these con conditions, the open data path is discontinuous measurement, so the parent is only taking data on the first trial. The closed data path is continuous measurement, okay, so they're actually collecting data on every trial. And what these treatment integrity data should tell you, with again, novice teachers, um, a parent and her child, uh, is that neither condition okay, is associated with lower integrity. In other words, collecting data on every trial didn't result in her being overwhelmed or skipping certain other steps. We just didn't see a practical advantage in those terms. Okay? A second parent, very similar results. Whether we had her collect first trial only or data on every trial, um, her integrity was high. And I should mention, these are um, dissertation data from Carrie Ann Condi, one of my um, doctoral students, and the project is ongoing. Then we asked parents, we said, so which of these do you prefer? Okay, so this is mom one, again, undifferentiated, high integrity, and she said, um, I'd like to, I'd prefer to collect with continuous data if you don't mind. When you see that vertical separation of one condition, that means it was selected in more of the, um, prior to more of the sessions by the parent. Okay, our second parent said, I don't care. And at the end, I think there were some negative reinforcers involved. She said, well, if you're going to make me pick, I guess I'll pick one. And this is also corroborated by the fact that she actually picked our control condition, um, which we can talk about later, but it was super reversive. There was no reason for her to go there other than to try and end this <laughs> evaluation. So one parent was non-differentiated. One parent had a preference for continuous data collection. How about efficiency? Were the sessions any faster um, when we just had first trial probes? No, they were not. Okay, the average was three minutes, ranging from two and a half to three and a half minutes per session for each of the measurement conditions. All of this is to say that teachers had idiosyncratic preferences, that there weren't measurable practical advantages in terms of what we looked at here. And it comes to, you know, um, the conclusion that when we're trying to make intuition-based decisions to help people, we probably ought to go ahead and measure to see if those advantages are really there. So give data the first say. And when you find that the approaches are actually quite similar, um, go ahead and let teachers have the final say. Do you want to collect data via first trial or on every trial? Um, if you've already determined both are appropriate for your decision-making purposes. Um, one important caveat is that we looked at these differences in integrity. Obviously, I'm only showing you a subset of data in a project that's ongoing. Um, but there may be other teaching conditions where first trial is much more appropriate and does have advantage advantages. For example, naturalistic teaching, incidental teaching of language. Um, there could be good advantages there that aren't captured by these data. But the take-home point is, don't assume there's an advantage. Measure. Find out. And if you don't see a clear advantage, but you're still okay with either route, let teachers decide what works best for them. Okay, that's a data-driven approach to uh, making decisions about the procedures we use. I'm not going to have time to go through all the details on this child effects project, but the main point I want to drive home here is that um, student progress reinforces teacher behavior. So just like Noah reinforced my reprimanding with his momentary disruption of playing with the light sockets. Uh, one of Carrie's studies, uh, Carrie and Condi's studies, demonstrated that when we made teachers teach really tough targets, so um, the students were unlikely to make the same level of progress, um, when the target was developmentally inappropriate, there were some drawing tasks. One was tracing, one was actually drawing a shape free form. When we put parents in those teaching conditions where it was a really hard to teach task, their integrity looked like this closed data path. Okay? They stopped doing what we asked them to do. And that makes sense, right? Because those child-mediated consequences were telling them, I'm not getting anywhere. You know, this kid is not going to learn this task this way. I have to try something different. Okay, this is a non-data decision-making influence that will affect the degree to which your treatments are carried out. So you need to use data to track it, to be aware of it, and to try and find ways to better support teachers in those tough situations. So just a couple quick suggestions on this, and then I'm going to have to get to the get to the end, but when you're placing teachers in situations with tough child-mediated consequences, so extinction bursts, but we need you to go ahead and withhold that reinforcer, but the kid's going to engage in a lot of problem behavior. It's going to be tough to watch. It's going to be tough to manage. Um, or a tough teaching situation, so it's a skill we know will not be acquired right away, but we want you to keep at it because we think if we try hard enough and do enough teaching, the student will get there. Um, it's probably a good idea in those tough situations to try and support teachers by, for example, rotating them. Okay, so don't make the same teachers do the hardest work all the time if you can make those decisions. Trying to individualize support, so find out what practical changes might um, make the teaching situation more reinforcing for the teachers. One of those that I recommend, by the way, is showing the teachers doing the tough procedures their data. 
Sometimes you can see little signs of progress in data that you wouldn't necessarily identify in the moment uh, as you're teaching, and that can be enough okay, to kind of keep you going and help you stay the course. And finally, consider modifying the procedures. Is there an effective but less punishing you know, treatment that we could maybe implement with higher integrity and still get an outcome that's lasting and that's meaningful? Okay, I apologize that I've got to rush a little bit, but I want to make sure we have a minute for your questions. So take home points, I've reviewed the three strategies here, and I've got a quick application question for you. So how could you use data in a more effective way to temper those non-data influences that we talked about in number five? So hopefully you identified at least one. Um, and I want you to think about what data do you need? What data, maybe you need to collect it, maybe you just need to look at it, maybe you need to talk to somebody about it to help you temper the effects of that other decision-making influence so it doesn't start driving the bus, okay? So that it's one among many factors, including good data. And then after you think of that, I want you to think about who else in your organization could help you with this. Because again, you can't do this on your own, okay? Um, may, you may not be in charge of the decisions that are relevant. You may not have access to the information you need. Who else can you recruit to help you to temper those influences through good data? Take a minute to think about that and also, to submit a question if you have one. I'm going to try and start online maybe this time and then um, get to any here in the room. If you're feeling a little stuck, just look back at that last application. Hopefully you circled or starred a factor that you could think about specifically with a tough case right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I don't see any questions online. Um, I'll give you a few more seconds to be first, and then I'll go ahead and open it up to the room here. And it can be questions about this application. I know this is a little bit tough. That's why I think really thinking about one particular tough case or tough to teach target that you've experienced recently or spent a lot of time working on, even if it's in the distant past, could be very helpful. Okay, here in the room, any questions? related to the specific application or to this section more generally? No? Is anybody comfortable sharing an example of their application? So one, and you don't even have to give the scenario, but just uh, some data that could help you to temper other decision-making factors? I'll do it. Cool, Ben. Yeah. So I'm looking at um, an organiz organization's mission statement, mm -hmm. um, and that's something that often influences the tough cases. Yeah. Uh, like, well, if we want to spend some energy on that, it doesn't really line up with our organization's mission statement, so let's not do it. Yeah. Um, so this would be, uh, I guess, a way to collect some data on a hard case to maybe, I wouldn't try to alter their mission statement, but add a piece to it. But I find that that hap happens quite a bit. Is yeah, it, the hard stuff doesn't sync up with a mission statement, so they don't want to do it. Right, so. and I've seen some value-based statements. Um, you know, for example, that we don't use timeout um, or other sort of more explicitly punishment-oriented, aversive procedures, or we don't use physical guidance. You know, um, but if you could negotiate in a specific case with oversight and uh, coordination among parties to measure the degree to which a procedure like that was effective and potentially even preferred by the recipient, the client you're working with, because we have a bit of data to suggest punishment is actually, it can be preferred in treatment contexts because it helps people to be more effective, um, potentially. Um, so, but if you could get like a trial approval to show some data to make a case that in some conditions that value-based statement is not the best way to do your decision making. Um, that could be powerful, but it would take some good collaboration. Yeah, fortunately, the decision makers are all for it. It's the folks that implement the mission ah. that are it's So, like administrators? Okay. So, they would have to be on, at that table, you know, in that process. This is not easy stuff, guys. I'm trying to condense it down to like slam, bam, here's your strategies, <laughs> but I know the realities, the realities of your very challenging everyday work are more complex. So I hope we can continue the conversation. Make sure I didn't miss anything online. Oh, we yeah, do have. Okay, can I go? Can I have a minute to yeah. do those? Okay. Yeah, um, let's see. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, so if you're a BCBA or in supervision, sorry, I'm having trouble just scanning. I've got to say it out loud. <laughs> Look for other BCBAs to supervise you further for your specific case. I think that's a recommendation, maybe. Yeah. So try to get other BCBAs on your team to put your head together about how could we evaluate this or how could we present the case to the administrators um, to get more data and less of the other factors into the decision making. So thank you for the recommendation. And the name of the study uh, I mentioned by Carrie Ann Conde, it's C-O-N-D-E. That's not published, it's still in data collection. Carrie's defended it for her dissertation, but we hope to run additional participants. Um, but feel free to contact me if you're interested and I'm happy to share more of the data or the draft of the manuscript with you. Uh, but that is ongoing. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so it's about, uh, well, again, it's not about. It's actually <laughs> exactly 121. Let's take a 10-minute break. Um, so for people online, well, for everybody, let's start again at 1.30. Well, 1.30 Eastern. Um, and uh, that's it. <laughs>